my great pleasure to invite Stephen Bygrave uh, to come and give us a summary of the Australia as a Renewable Energy Superpower report and to uh, perhaps astound you with some of the discoveries they've made. But for Stephen Bygrave. Thanks, Roman, for that uh, warm welcome, and thanks, Philip, uh, also for the introductory remarks. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we're gathered tonight. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here in Adelaide to launch the Renewable Energy Superpower Plan. This is now the fifth of our Zero Carbon Australia series. So we've already done reports, as Roman <laughs> mentioned, on energy, on zero emissions buildings, on high speed rail zero emissions agriculture. Uh, this is a report on exports and how we can really shift the debate about Australia being dependent on fossil fuels for its economic prosperity. We've also got an electric vehicles report that's just gone to our desktop publisher and uh, that will be launched hopefully in late July. So that's quite an exciting report as well. So a little bit about beyond zero emissions. Our, our role is to uh, look at how we can rapidly decarbonise Australia's economy. And this is quite a, quite a task, but it is technically possible. And if we are to meet the global warming targets that have been set for us in Paris, uh, of 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees Celsius by the end of the century, then we will have to move to zero emissions over the next few decades. And Beyond zero emissions, we actually don't agree with the two degree target. We've already seen the impacts of one degree warming around the world. We've got the Great Barrier Reef dying in front of us. We've got the Solomon Islands who in the last few weeks have just lost five islands to sea level rise. And this is only with one degree Celsius increase. So you can imagine a world which is two degrees warmer uh, and certainly a lot scarier than the world we're currently in. So we need to be moving to safe levels of climate change, and we need to be moving to zero emissions as rapidly as possible. So our vision is really to transform the Australian economy from a fossil fuel-based economy into a high-tech, clean energy, renewable energy-powered economy. And we've been doing reports now for the last 10 years, and just this year, we were ranked in the top 10 of global think tanks globally. <laughs> Uh, by the Lauder Institute at the University of Pennsylvania on our research, which is now being recognised internationally. We have various collaborations with universities around Australia, so we were able to draw off the best research uh, in, in, uh, from our universities nationally. So we've done a lot of research with the University of Melbourne, but also with AMU and the University of New South Wales, but also the University of Newcastle. And I've just uh, formed a collaboration with the University of Queensland, uh, the Global Change Institute up there. So this is a really powerful alliance. And as I mentioned, it, it enables us to draw the best research available to show how this transition can occur. The various reports we've done, uh, stationary energy, how we can transition our economy to be based on 100% renewable energy. Our buildings plan, how we can retrofit all of our existing buildings to be zero emissions. High speed rail, electric vehicles, uh, land use, and uh, we've also launched an energy freedom home book showing how every home through nine steps can have can wipe out its electricity bills and gas bills. So we've been busting various myths along the way. So some of the myths are uh, renewables don't work when the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow. We heard that from the previous Prime Minister. Uh, we also uh, have heard that 100% renewable energy isn't technically possible and the renewables can't but provide base load power. So this first report we did some five years ago has, has really busted those myths. Similarly with buildings, some of the myths around buildings that high efficiency electrical appliances powered by solar can't meet our building energy needs. Gas is as good as solar, we're hearing this more and more from the gas industry trying to piggyback on the solar revolution. And there's no such thing as zero emissions buildings. And again, we've busted some of those myths. The Renewable Energy Superpower Plan, which we're launching tonight, we're really reframing what is an energy superpower. We're reframing the debate around fossil fuels being central to our economic <laughs> prosperity. And we're reframing the argument that decarbonisation is again
against Australia's economic interests. And we're pushing very hard that renewables can actually be the basis of our energy superpower status. There are many points in this report. It's quite a technically dense report. Please, uh, we have copies of the report available for sale, or you can also download them for free on our website. But what I want to do tonight is really just highlight four points. There are many more points in the report itself, but if you take away nothing tonight but these four points, then I will have achieved something positive. So the first point, the reality that the global economy is shifting to zero emissions. In this transition, in this shift, huge investments will flow to renewable energy and energy efficiency. In fact, that investment is already flowing, and I'll, I'll present some numbers from the International Energy Agency in this presentation. So in this new global economy that we're transitioning to very rapidly, countries with fast, cheap, reliable renewable energy will be the economic powerhouses of the future. And Australia just happens to be one of those countries with our huge renewable energy resource and our comparative advantage. We are in a perfect position to harness the investment and jobs as this transition unfolds. So they're the four points I'm going to run through now, one by one. First point, beyond zero emissions, we love graphs. So apologies in advance if you don't like graphs. This graph is showing emissions along the left-hand side. I wish I had a pointer, but I don't. So on the left-hand side, you've got emissions, and along the bottom, you've got years. So you can see that emissions are still going up, and up in a quite dramatic form. Uh, in fact, uh, Hugh Sadler, who will be on our panel tonight, will show that emissions in Australia have basically gone up. We're recarbonising. Sorry to steal your words here. Not decarbonising, but even in a four degree world, which is not what we want, and in a two degree world, emissions will have to peak and then rapidly decline. In a two degree world, they will have to decline, as shown in this slide, to zero emissions by 2070. As I said before, we don't agree with the two degree target, which is what was agreed in Paris by the world leaders. We agree in, in a, we, we are proposing a much steeper decline, in which case we'd be moving to zero emissions in the next few decades. And a four degree world, even under that scenario, uh, emissions will need to peak and then decline. And the World Bank has said a four degree world will not sustain our current institutions and social fabric. It's not the world we want to be getting to. In Paris, we got an agreement. It may not be the perfect agreement, but I think we will all look back in decades to come as Paris, the Paris Climate Conference of December 2015 as being a turning point, where we said the age of fossil fuels is over and the age of clean energy has begun. And this slide shows you, again, another graph but it shows you that the fossil energy era, which we've been used to over the last 200 years, will finish and is finishing. And there will be a transition period between 2020, 2040 or so, 2015, 2040, as shown on this slide, where there will be a transition from the fossil energy era to the clean energy era. And in this transition period, there will be huge investment, as I mentioned earlier, in renewable energy and energy efficiency in electric vehicles. And then in the clean energy era, we will be attracting into this country with our vast renewable energy resource, emissions intensive, trade exposed industries. We may be exporting clean energy through our goods and services, but also attracting emissions intensive industry in this country because we will have that comparative advantage. So let's go through the second point. The transition will involve large-scale investment in renewables and energy efficiency. This slide is from the International Energy Agency. They do a World Energy Outlook every few years. The International Energy Agency is a traditionally conservative organisation. It's an international organisation based in Paris. Every report they put out is revised soon after because they find that their assumptions were conservative. 
So bear in mind that this slide, we think, is a conservative estimate of the investment that will occur in the energy sector globally in the next 20 years. Even with this conservative estimate, half of the investment globally in the energy sector will be in renewables and energy efficiency. Some 53 trillion US dollars will be invested in that period, and half of that will be in renewables and energy efficiency and only 1% will be in coal. This demonstrates the age of coal is over or rapidly declining as it is with gas. And the age of renewables are very fair and squarely uh, right here. The third point of the four points I'll be running through. We ranked Australia in its renewable energy resource compared with other countries globally in this report. And we did this because we all know that Australia is a sunny country, we all know that we've got lots of solar potential, but we really wanted to do this in a, in a thorough, quantitative way. So we looked at energy production potential per square kilometre, we looked at energy production potential from the total land area, we looked at energy production potential from the unutilised land area, and also from the rural land area. And no matter which way you cut it, Australia is in the top three or two or one of countries globally with renewable energy resource. So our renewable energy resource is vast. Not only that, but we decided to do a really conservative estimate of the, of the number. How many exajoules of renewable energy capacity do we have in this country? What we did is we modelled only solar and wind potential. We looked at solar and wind resource only within 10 kilometres of the current electricity grid. So in other words, highly accessible to our current generation grid. We also excluded sensitive land areas like national parks. And we only looked at solar and wind capacity which was cost competitive with existing generation capacity. Extremely conservative analysis. So conservative, in fact, that it amounts to about 4% of Australia's total economically demonstrated renewable energy resource. But even that extremely conservative analysis comes up with a figure of 5,000 exajoules. 5,000 exajoules is enough to power the world for 10 years. So this is a huge energy resource that we have at our fingertips. And our rooftop solar, you know, South Australia is leading the world and leading, you know, one of the leading states uh, with rooftop solar penetration. What, what is very rarely uh, known, actually, is that Australia does have the highest penetration of rooftop solar in the world. And even in the United States, we have a country of 300 million people. We've got about 800,000 houses which are connected to rooftop solar in the US. In Australia, with a population of some 23, 24 million people, there's 1.3, 1.4 million houses with rooftop solar. So not only is it the highest penetration rate in relative terms, it's also the highest absolute number of rooftop solar installations in the world. Not only that, but we also try to quantify our renewable energy resource against our fossil energy resource. Because, the, as I mentioned, one of the myths that's often put out there is we have so much coal, and coal is great for humanity, and we've got coal for 200, 300 odd years. What we did in this report is we quantified the amount of renewable energy resource, solar and wind, compared with oil, gas, uranium, and uh, coal combined. And solar and wind capacity in Australia far outweighs all of those oil, coal, uh, uh, gas, and uranium resources combined. So that just, uh, again, puts that myth to bed. As this revolution unfolds, and it is already unfolding, and I've got some, the next few slides will kind of show this, there will be a, a, an amazing transformation in the local energy system, but also in the global energy system. In the local energy system, we're already seeing this. 
booms in solar PV investment, decarbonisation, homes becoming independent. We've got battery prices falling some 20 to 60 percent in the next four years, where it will become a reality for many households to go: Do I stay on grid? Do I put batteries on? Do I still stay on grid and then also supplement that with batteries? Do I buy an electric vehicle and, and charge that at work and drive home with a fully charged battery and plug that into my home and run my home or supplement my home's energy? So this is all rapidly unfolding in the next four to five years. Networks and generators must adapt. We've got the head of AGL and the head of Origin saying, we're not gonna build new coal and new gas uh, generation capacity. Our new generation capacity will be renewable energy. They know this because they can see householders, that's their customer base, and they know customers will move and move off grid if they don't uh, provide the incentives to keep their customer base. And there will be stranded assets if they don't get this right. Similarly, in the global energy system, we'll see a boom in renewables, and we're already seeing that. Decarbonisation unfolding at a rapid rate. Nations even becoming energy, energy independent. Right now, the global shipping trade, 45% of all shipping is shipping oil and gas and coal around various countries around the world. So in a decarbonised world where we're not burning coal and oil and gas, there goes 45% of the global shipping trade. Nations will become energy independent. Again, fossil energy supplies must adapt. And nations, such as Australia, with cheaper renewable energy will be, be the economic powerhouses of the future, attracting energy intensive industries. Last point, point number four. Sorry to bombard you, but uh, we've got a great panel. I don't want to take up too much time for questions and answers with the panel tonight. But the last point I want to leave with you is that there will be this massive investment, it already is, and we will attract this investment to Australia. In a decarbonised world, as I mentioned, energy intensive industries will flock to countries with cheap renewable energy. The energy intensive trade value right now globally is some 2.3 US, 2.3 trillion US dollars per year. So that's the global uh, value right now of the energy intensive sector and that will just continue to grow and with a uh, vast renewable energy resource such as Australia we have the ability to attract a lot of that investment. Again this is analysis from the International Energy Agency showing the huge, the exponential rise in investment in energy, in renewable energy and energy efficiency globally which has not only occurred recently but will just continue to occur. So this shows in 2013, again, the IEA analysis, which is conservative, in 2013, some 380 billion US dollars was invested in energy efficiency, electric vehicles, biofuels, and renewables. That's predicted to grow to some 750 billion US dollars by 2020, and then to 2,400 billion US dollars per year by 2035. This is not our analysis, it's the International Energy Agency analysis. So this is real, it's happening right now. Australia can be part of that, or it can let the opportunity go by. <coughs> Even with a 20% renewable energy target, there's been analysis that shows from the Climate Institute that shows that there will be some $20 billion of investment by 2030 and that will create some 31,000 jobs. Labor has committed to a 50% renew renewable energy target by 2030, in which case those figures would at least double. And even with a 20% target, some 5,000 of those 31,000 jobs will be in South Australia, which would include manufacturing jobs. So again, South Australia and Australia, perfectly positioned to harvest this investment and the jobs that will flow. You probably can't read this text, but I just wanted to point out that there are a range of recommendations in the report around what governments can do, what business can do, and what households can do to not only prepare 
for this transition, but also to maximise the opportunities from this, from this transition. We need higher renewable energy targets. We need to stop the rollout of gas network, gas as a fossil fuel. We need to go back to the drawing board when it comes to national energy market reform, because it's been a failure in this country where we've got electricity prices in Australia where they were the cheapest, one of the cheapest countries in the world for electricity and now in, the, in one of the highest uh, uh, electricity prices in the OECD, following energy market reform. So we clearly haven't got that right. Businesses can start to invest if we have the right policy signals from government, can start to invest in renewables and energy efficiency and position themselves for this, for this uh, transition. And households can also take positive steps. Rooftop solar, energy efficiency, electric vehicles, next time you purchase an appliance, look at its energy rating, uh, prepare for, the, for these kind of uh, investments so you don't get that <coughs> shock when your dishwasher breaks down and you suddenly have to rush out to Harvey Norman. You've done the research beforehand, you know which appliances you want to buy. So beyond zero emissions, we pride ourselves on busting myths. So this report is no different. Some of the myths we've busted, but we need coal and gas for our ongoing economic prosperity. Renewables can't power our economy, and we have far more coal and gas than renewables. Again, we've busted these myths. That's the last of my slides. I'm really looking forward to your questions and answers uh, tonight. We've got a fantastic panel, and Philippa will now hopefully introduce the panel. Please come and speak to me afterwards as well, and if you're interested in taking away a book at the end, please come and do so. If not, you can download one for free on our website, bzd.org.au. Thank you. Well, Stephen, thank you very much for coming to Adelaide, because that's been a very refreshing look. It's given me a new view on competitive advantage. I haven't really thought through that if you have a lot of renewable energy, you could actually attract a lot of emissions intensive industries that need to keep going to be part of that transition. 